Hi there, folks, and welcome back to Ukes of Alex, the podcast and YouTube series where we talk about the ukulele, ukulele culture, everything you can think of in between, and occasionally we try and learn something along the way. Today's guest is somebody that I would say could be credited as getting me into the ukulele in the first place. This is somebody that was my manager at the Southern Ukulele Store for several years before I took that role on, and he is the long-haired wizard in the Mother Yukas, as you uh, probably all know by now, as he's on the screen, is Paul Tucker. Hi, Paul. How are you doing? Hello, Alex. Uh, firstly, I'd like to apologise for getting you into the ukulele. <laughs> well, it's not your fault. I mean, you, that was literally your job at the time, and uh, I came in thinking I was going to sell electric guitars, and next thing... You, resist, you resisted well for a long time. <laughs> yeah, I, for the first couple of years, it was purely business, and then eventually, I think I just I took yeah. one home, and... There you go. I'm, I was stuck with it, but I they think get uh, everyone. <laughs> you got into it. So, so um, I think just really before the boom, the ukulele boom of the early 2010s hit, uh, what, what got you into the ukulele? What was your introduction? Uh, my, for me, I was, I was, I was working in the shop that we worked in first, but I was working for Johnny, Johnny Langdon. So it was Langdon's electric music there. And then uh, one year, I used to do Valama Tree every year. I used to run the ARC stage at Valama Tree Festival. And uh, on the Wednesday night, the first act was the Ukulele Orchestra of Great Britain. And so you got, you got I think it was seven or nine of them at the time. They came up and said, uh, you know, there's all of us and none of us plug in, which is like the engineer's nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> what do I do? Yeah. Got a, got a, you know, I've got a load of DI boxes lined up the front thinking this is going to be cool. So no. So, so I'm, I'm going to have around other stages, scrounging condenser mics or any mics I can find sort of thing. So, um, and they just blew me away. It was just, it, and, and what it was, it wasn't just the proficiency of the playing or the, the characters it was it was just it was just a show and yeah. and that's what was great about it it was there was there was elements of comedy um bravada it was just it was just great i went back into uh langdon's following week and mentioned to johnny about what i'd seen and everything like that and he bought me a lanakai pineapple as a bit of a joke gift he was going and gave it to me you know just <laughs> ordered it gave it to me and said there you go mate that's your own ukulele and I just started mucking about with it and I was hooked. And then shortly after that, I hooked up with a great bunch of people who run a, a website back, back in the days where social media wasn't so big. You know, you had MySpace, I think that was it. But there were great, like, for, what were forums, basically. And there was one called the Ukulele Cosmos. And I got in with those guys and they were just wonderful. That was, a, I think that was the first time we ever took the shop out of the shop sort of thing as well. Once, once Southern Ukulele Store started, Rob um, Rob sent me up to Holsley Hollisley in um, Suffolk, and I I stood in the gazebo all weekend selling ukuleles. It was great fun. Yeah, that was the first festival, was it? Holsley. I think it was. Yeah, I think yeah, I think that might have been our first our first sort of like venture out of the shop. So yeah. that so that that time frames. I mean, we must have been what two thousand seven. Then that you saw. You play your sugar Great Britain? It would have been, I think it was, I think it was either late 2000, well, it would have been, if it was Lama Tree, it would have been uh, August, because I think the like, end, end of August, beginning of September is always the Lama Tree Festival. So it would have been there. And then, I mean, and then I, I mean, I kind of bullied Rob all the time saying, can we get some ukuleles? And we ended up with like, one tiny wall in in Langdon's electric music with mm -hmm. ukulele and mainly, mainly of what were regarded at the time as the better one. So we had, um, I think Stag were doing a all solid mahogany wood um, soprano for about a hundred quid, which was a cracking little uke sort of yeah. thing. And then, but, and the slim but pickings, well, it stands out when there's yeah, not oh, lots of choice. Those yeah, really but, did stand out. Yeah, yeah, when when you're when you're in a sea of like very cheap sort of like fruit box painted ukuleles sort of thing, you know, something which is a bit like, oh, blimey, this is a bit yeah. loud. I don't think like that. And then and then I kind of started looking at this and looking at that. And Rob was always doing already doing a little bit of Carla over the road sort of thing. So we were starting to we were looking at the better Carla stuff. So we were looking at that and everything like that. And then I think I think the first one we went for outside of 
what we could already get was Ohana. And that yeah. I think that's when it really swung. I mean, I don't know if you can remember from when you were there, but our our, our stockroom come kitchen, come toilet, come joke room, come everything, so, which yeah, was yeah. just like a corridor down the side of the shop. Yeah. You could not move. We had metal racking in there and you could not move for Ohana ukuleles. There were just like hundreds of them all shoved in. And, yeah. Ohana and Carla, I remember they both had their own, they had both had their own uh, shell, not shelf, but their own unit. And yeah. The, the Ohana, I mean, I, I'd forgotten just how important Ohana was at the beginning. I think Carla were always a brand, but yeah. Ohana, you know, bigging them up, they continue to be a real ukulele centric company like the Carla yeah. are, you know, they're a lifestyle brand, but Ohana, there's something about Ohana Sopranos in particular. I think, I think what it was is um, what Ohana managed to achieve. And I don't know if this was accidentally or deliberately. I mean, they had the SK range, which was the Sopranos. And uh, basically you went, you went up a little bit of money and I can remember every time in the shop, people would come in, they want to buy a ukulele. They're not really kind of sure how much they want to spend. You put an SK 10 in their hand. They're like, no, like that. You yeah. get up to the SK 35 and regardless of what they said their budget was, they bought the SK 35. Yeah, it, was it was so affordable back then. I mean, well under 200 it, quid. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I think it was about 130 or 140 quid at the time. That's what I had and in it, my head too. It stayed that way for so many years. And it was it was a complete get. Even between the SK25 going up to the 30, the 35 was just an unbelievable ukulele. Just really, what you know. And, yeah. and I think that kind of like, and I think on the back of that, we kind of started getting out there. Also, I was kind of quite, prevalent sort of like on the scene as well through the ukulele cosmos and everything so i i kind of networked quite a bit to sort of try and get it out there and that we were a place where people could come for you know and then rob was always i, I literally would go over because we have the two shops on the opposite side of the road i go over to rob and i just say look i've seen these and he'd yeah. go leave it to me so that was it i was i was the spotter and then he he would make it happen and he made it happen every time i got that i don't know how amazing 12 years later that's still the case that's exactly what happens now i mean if i yeah. see something rob says well if you think it's a good idea let's try it and yeah uh, yeah it, it, i mean just variety is the spice of life i mean i'm guessing that's how Kanalea came to came about and Koala. E everything everything that w we eventually ended up doing would be would be that there was a bit of a vibe going on you could search it out a little bit on youtube or something like that and then yeah. i mean i mean i think it was a massive coup for for southern ukulele store to to get the k brands to mm -hmm. to be the first shop in the uk to start you know to start doing that yeah i mean I before mean, we that couldn't have known how how we couldn't have known how far that would go as well because the early days it, we were mainly ordering sopranos and it was a yeah. long transition to the the tenors and oh 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 yeah yeah i would yeah. say i'd say 80 percent of our stock when we first started would would be soprano and that was that's what people were coming to look at as well you know that's yeah. soprano you know it was it was way before i mean i mean I can remember where the kind of sort of like where it almost turned on its head and suddenly, I don't know, I think there was a couple of things on forums and things like that where people kind of insinuated was that Sopranos were like beginner's ukes. Yeah. And then it kind of all changed. And then yeah. people who thought they were, were, were players or anything like that didn't want to play a Soprano because they didn't want to be associated with the beginner's uke. Where... Yeah. I mean, anyone who plays ukulele, you know, soprano is probably the hardest size to play. Yeah, to it's... master, definitely. When you when you hear or see a good soprano player, you definitely feel <laughs> inadequate <laughs> yeah, because yeah. most of the time, when you hear a soprano, it's so thin. If you can be technical with that, what you get is kind of like being good at parlor guitar. You know, yeah. you, if you learn to play with that dynamic range, you get so much out yeah. of it. I, yeah. I, it's interesting. I mean, I I just think I, all I've, I I wanted to do this podcast because my memories of the first few years of the shop are quite hazy. I think I yeah. remember that wall and then I remember we extended over the top of the, um, kind of alcove in the, in the, the, the beam. Yeah. We, we, we went right across the beam. Yeah. But yeah. It was when we moved to where we are now, um, uh, in, in Southbourne when we had yeah. the concert wall, the tenor wall, 
and yeah. things really kind of picked up. And yeah, we had the, we, we, we all, all my crazy ideas about the uh, the ropey old sofa, which uh, which I thought was going to be a big, good place for wives to sit while husbands tried the ukuleles. It turned out it was just a good place for the staff to sit. Yeah, yeah, that that was the problem. I mean, uh, the sofa, the sofa was my favourite thing about the shop because I used to get here. I still do. Things don't change. You know, I used to get here so early, and oh God, uh, yeah, I used yeah, to just I used to just lie on that sofa. But... <laughs> lie on the sofa for an hour and uh but yeah we had to get rid of that sofa eventually because we it, it coincided with us having to ban dogs because but really well behaved dogs all wanted to mark their territory on the sofa and there's only so many times you can wash sofa cushions before rob no. came out with a with a stanley knife and just carved the thing apart um oh, no. but now we, we've got sofas again and they're uh they're a massive part of how we serve customers because they help us social distance. Yeah, yeah, totally, yeah. Um, yeah. So, and of course, when you were doing those festivals in the early days, uh, I think that's probably when you met Pete Howlett, who you're uh, very, very close to. Uh, yes, yeah, it, it was. I mean, we, we had a bit of a false start with um, with Pete in the shop. He came down to, to sort of like... Um, show us his wares and for us to do his ukuleles but it all worked out absolutely fine in the end i i um developed a relationship with Pete and started playing his ukuleles and i think pretty much over the last nine whatever years it is of the mother you because i've done virtually every gig on a howl at ukulele yeah and what um, howlets do you use or have you used uh, I've uh, so I've started off with a euclectic, which is one of the solid body ones. But we were doing gigs where I needed to be able to hear something acoustically off the instrument because you turn up at gigs and they'd have no monitors or something like that, and then you really need to be able to hear. So, so I went over. I, I am, um, I, I had quite a bit of an inv involvement. Pete designed a ukulele. Uh, which was like a boat paddle ukulele and he needed a name for it. And I said, I said, why don't you call it Marmite? Because some people will love them and some people will hate them. Yeah. And, and he went with the Marmite thing. I also named the Revelator as well. I seem to be quite lucky at naming people. Oh, there you go. That's cool. So, yeah. So um, uh, I started using the Marmite ukuleles uh, uh, and I bought them as well. I'd like to add, <laughs> they yeah. didn't give them to me. <laughs> and, yeah, Pete, um, Pete, Pete was on my podcast. He made a point of saying that he doesn't give instruments away for free. I, no, and, no. Um, I think that's important because it's uh, in I, the modern I, world. I, yeah, I, pl I play Pete Howlett ukuleles because for me, I believe they're the best ukuleles. And also because the Marmites were a decent price at the time, I could play I could play a handmade ukulele, which didn't matter if I dropped it on the floor and it smashed, I'd just get another one. Yeah. You, know, you wore I, out I, a couple, didn't you? I remember. Yeah, yeah. Me and me and Johnny have both worn out instruments. <laughs> We've like, yeah, yeah. We have to usually stick big bits of plastic on the front of them to stop us going through them, sort of thing. But we we play a lot and we play hard sort of thing. So yeah, so I've been yeah. Pete's been, and Pete's been wonderful. I went, I went and spent a couple of weeks with him on a building course, and he taught me so much. Um, yeah, a wonder, a wonderful man, a wonderful man, and a great um, ukulele. He, well, yeah, he's yeah, a great, very good blues player. Um, aside from aside from Howlett's, I mean, I'm not trying to pull you away. I mean, I remember you had you've had a, a vast instrument collection, but specifically ukuleles. I remember you've had a sept, a Koloa scepter, and um, various. Yeah. kind of very odd instruments that you, you tend to be drawn to the unusual. Can you tell us a bit about some of the instruments you've had? Well, the, the, the scepter, which I can actually see now, it's just hanging up on the wall there, um, was something that really appealed to me. I just love the show. I, I, I had to get one in, especially to sell to Al Wood, who runs Uke Hunt. And uh, I played it a little bit in the shop before he took it on and thought, oh my God, if only they did this in a concert because i've always been a concert player i i i i my teaching ukes a tenor which was built for, by my good friend daryl kersley which is an unusual uke which is an all yeah. english uke uh but for playing out i like a concert uke so the skeptor really appealed to me and it's the only ukulele i own that has never been out of the house uh it's never been out of the house it's 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 too special enough to gig as well i mean you can't put a pickup in it um, you, no, no. Uh, 
I've thought about that long and hard and you can't put a pick up in it. No, that's it. So, so, and, and then we were in the early days, we'd have people come in the shop and they would show us their wares or what they would made. So quite often I would, we, um, uh, I, Richard, I think his name was who in Wales, he made ukuleles. I ended up with some of his little weird free string ukuleles. I've got a couple oh, of those. Yeah. I met wrong one and a, a, a nylon Cross, Richard Croft, Richard Cross. I think it was, he made some really wonderful, um, uh, sort of like some of the first electric ukuleles and they'd have a interesting sound holes. Like they'd be like a, uh, yeah, uh, quite, yeah. and they were, they were great instruments. So no, like, about you know, them. they were very cool. Yeah. I think I was one of the first people in the UK to have a firefly and I was, you know, and this was all through Rob being able to get these things in and then, and then me just sort of like, just not being able to resist. Like most times I must've gone over to music as I'm said, Rob, can I have one of these? <laughs> so like yeah. must've, must've annoyed him slightly. It's an important yeah. part of the job though. I've learned that. Um, the amount I love of what things. you do. You've got, you've yeah. Got a, you've yeah, and no matter how hard any job gets, I mean, if you you have to enjoy a part of it, and I, I absolutely love talking about and looking at beautiful instruments. <laughs> it never gets old. No, it doesn't. Yeah, I mean, we we are we are. I mean, with what you do at the shop and what I get to do, we're still gigging and teaching everything. I mean, we're we're working within what we love. We're all it's all music at the end of the day, and we're we're very lucky people to be able to do that. So you know, there's a lot of people who don't get to do that. Amen to that around that kind of 2010 2011 time when we moved here i think that's when you started the mother yukas with john t uh, well mother yukas uh came out of um uh we'd started we'd start we were still at the old shop and we'd started doing a few better brands so we were now doing um Kawaya. so the, the the standout one for them was the, the 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 absolute sort of like you know i've for quite a while it was kind of like the mecca of ukuleles was the kts7 yeah. that was like and a a guy came in the shop one day and he looks at some ukes and he again didn't really know, know how much he wanted to spend but ended up i think he bought a can lay a concert first and then he quickly went on to the kts7 and decided that he was a soprano man and that was jonty who's the uh, front man of the mother yukas and uh so he started coming along to Susbus, which was the um, Southern Ukulele store, uh, Bournemouth Ukulele Social, which I was running at the time out of the green room. And that was once a month. And it was a great laugh. And so, it, it spawned so many good ukulele bands locally. You know, you think yeah. the Daisy Ukuleles, the, the, the girls who were fantastic. Um, it's where people like Beth Johnson cut her teeth and everything, who's now gone on to do great things, you know. Yeah. Uh, so, um, and John T just said to me, he said, he said, how do you fancy joining a band called the Mother You? Because I've already done the T-shirts, the badges, and I've got the website and everything. That's his, that's so, his trade, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he'd already sorted out all. That's where we have like been so lucky over the years. John is a, is an absolute master at, at that side of things. You know, if you want something doing on the internet or you want merch for something, he's your man. He'll, he'll yeah. get it knocked out. And uh, and yeah, and I, originally I think the idea was to be a little bit like the ukulele orchestra of Great Britain. There was going to be like ten of us and everything like that. We got together, the two of us, and started gigging straight away. You know, our first gig was supporting Miles Hunt from the Wonder Stuff. And, you know, it was kind of, it, it just, it snowballed so quickly. It, it was, became very apparent that, it became, two things became apparent that it was going to be very successful and that John T could not play bass and sing the way he wanted to. So, so oh, we had to... a great to, singer and a great bass player. I'd forgotten bass, all about his bass playing. He's an amazing yeah. bass player. Yeah. Yeah. He bought a U-Base first. I, he was he did. Of, he I think he was our first ever U-Base customer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was such a faulty ukulele. Some instruments, they just keep coming back for repairs. I swear that instrument came back that, every week. I mean, <laughs> yeah, we, we have, yeah. I mean, so that then that's made us think we need to get a bass player. And then I had a friend, a good friend from years ago called Daryl, Daryl Kersley. Yeah. And we kind of persuaded Daryl to do it. And Daryl probably really didn't have the time or the lifestyle to do it, but still did it. And we used to rehearse around his every Thursday. The rehearsals were 
were just it was just comedy it was just it was just we just go around there and laugh till we cried sort of thing it was it was great but and and it gave us that chance to think you know to be able to look at songs that we'd like songs that meant something to us in the past and and just think wouldn't that be amazing if you could pull that off on ukulele and then we'd just give it a go and it was you know and that's kind of what what happened that was the early days of it and then and then Daryl just couldn't commit to it and we were getting so busy that you know literally with a day's notice Daryl went and Jason came in I think our first gig with Jason was in Islington at a really kind of posh wedding in a restaurant he had to learn 24 songs in less than 24 hours so like a song an hour and he did it he cracked it what a guy I can't think of many people who would have been able to have done something like that and not been phased by it I ever told you the first time I met Jason it was in his no, no. as well. So I, yeah. I played, obviously I used to play in a band and when we were about 18, 19, we played in a really nasty pay to play venue in London. And what, I don't remember what his band was that he was in before, but they were. Fungus. Yes, that was the band. And he was in this, <laughs> they were, they were on before us. Um, and they were all quite a bit older than, I mean, you know, we're like 18. I mean, Jason must've been in his, early 30s mid 30s then yeah. and you know they were dressed like the blues brothers but like the blues brothers on on heroin kind of that was their yeah. look <laughs> and uh, he's got this wireless kit and he's running around this empty pub and he's yeah. just gyrating against a promoter because he he had long since cottoned on that this promoter was just a cock yeah. <laughs> and he really yeah. deserved to have his ruin his even ruined that's the first time i met jason and the next time i saw him he was your bass player and i didn't even know yeah. he was from bournemouth <laughs> well the, the, the thing about Jason is that every, I mean, every show, doesn't matter if there's one pe- person in the room and we're playing to thousands of people, his show is 100%. He only does one show. He's, you know, you, he, he, like you say, he'll run around in an empty venue or he'll run around in a, in a packed venue, you know. He, I mean, back in the days, the early days when we used to still use amps on stage, I mean, me and Johnny, you would crack up at him jumping off the top of his base amp, which was only about a foot <laughs> his high. Mini stack. Yeah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I remember him doing that as well. Oh God! Well, you guys, I I love love you guys. I mean, you played my wedding, and uh, oh, we did, yeah, yeah. And yeah. yeah, I just I think you're one of the few acts out there that can play a wedding where you know no one's going to dance, but if they want to. You're there to do it. You, there's yeah. elements of comedy. It's a full show, and I mean, you've never been shy of bookings. You're all, you've always seemed busy. Um, you've even done several gigs, kind of this month when it's cold. No one's got any budget for live music, and yeah. if people need cheering up, the Mother Eucas are just one of the best I've ever seen for that. We're we're ever ready. <laughs> ever ready. Yeah. Nice. So, um, can I just ask you a bit about some of the other projects you've done. So, I know you're currently playing in several bands, and you know yeah. you started. Uh, you started off in a rock band, kind of in the late eighties. Is that right? I was. Um, I I kind of. I suppose my first serious band would have been the early eighties, which was a band called The Gathering, and. Um, uh we we did the usual thing we got we played around an awful lot we got record company interests we did a couple of showcases for the likes of polydor and emi and we were uh, our, our bass player a guy called kev was um very much into early 70s prog so unlike a lot of the bands at the time we'd have songs which were seven minutes long and stuff like that you know which was quite unheard of like sort of in that kind of time of you know the three minute new wave type sort of stuff yeah. so it sort of set us apart like that but yeah we kind of we we had management and everything but we we always got that same thing of they'd say we think you're brilliant but we can't hear any singles and back then they really needed to be able to they they needed singles that's what that's what made bands big sort of thing so so that was that was good and i I mean i enjoyed that and i worked with um i worked with one of those guys again later griff the singer in a band called uh crow men which turned into crowfall so after i left went on to get signed and hit the big time a bit uh, I did a band called Wild Turkey, which was my most successful band from gigging point of view. We were so busy. We, you know, we played both here and over, you know, in France and, and that was great. And that was, that was great. It was a kind of mix between Black Crows and the Stones. And it was, nice. it was, it was open G five string telecasters through Mesa Boogies really loud. And, you know, it was, it was, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. So I had, I had kind of, I, I've always been kind of lucky. I've, whenever I've joined bands, they've either 
been good when I joined them or got good when I joined them. I've been quite sort of, I've never been in one of those bands who sort of, I mean, when I was in Wild Turkey, we, it was when Mr. Smith's, which was a, a massive local great venue. Great venue. Yeah, huge. Great Bournemouth Prob- venue. Probably most people would say the most influential venue Bournemouth's ever had, yeah. and which is quite incredible for a venue which was over, just over 100 people capacity if they play by the rules, you know. Yeah. So it's kind of like, I mean, I suppose it was the cellar bar of its day, you know, which is now the venue which everyone, you know, so it was a venue which supports music seven nights a week, which is fantastic, which is what Mr. Smith did. I mean, while Turkey, we could, we could do a Friday and a Saturday, we could sell out both shows and do the two nights or whatever. So it was kind of, yeah. So I was very, very fortunate. And That's then cool. to be able yeah. to do that ever. I mean, that's when yeah. you, yeah, that's something to kind of really hang your hat on. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, I've been, I've been very lucky like that. I don't, you know, but I think I also, I've made a lot of my luck as well. So, which is, which is what you've got yeah. to do in life. Yeah. yeah. So, and then, and then I kind of like, I kind of done a few little sort of projects, but nothing massively serious. Uh, I had a lot of fun with an electronic thing I did with a friend, a good friend of mine, Neil, called Lewis Recut and the Chairman, which Lewis Recut is just my name backwards, and yeah. and that was, I mean, uh, uh, that got to the stage where we were just using famous movie cut, well, not fake, we like Withnall and I, and I'm playing seven, I'm playing guitar, MIDI guitar synth using seven different loopers, and it was just. The setup was a couple of hours. The pack down was over an hour, and it was just, it just fried my brain. You just got to go, you, you, the, the the gig became not about music but about counting, because you're thinking, right, I've got to count that one, in, but I've got to do this, I've got to do that, and it was just like, yeah, a lot of I, fun, but uh, a lot of. <laughs> is that the band? Sorry, is that the band where you dressed up as Doctor Who and the Master? Yeah, we did. Yeah, nice splicing yeah. yeah, that think... photo in for people watching at home. <laughs> You certainly can. I thought I made a dashing master, and 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 Neil looks like a cross between John Pertwee and John Inman, which is quite an <laughs> um, So moving forward to the present day, then. So apart from the Mother Yukas, um, what what projects have you got on the go now? Right. Uh, um, oh, cool. So I just imagine getting on for about two and a half, three years ago. A group of friends uh, were in a band called the Fox and the Owl. And I'd been to see him several times. And then it, it um, transpired that one of them had got an opportunity to go to a festival. They had a gig. I said, I'll step in and I'll play bass for you. Uh, I played bass. It went well. Uh, and then I kind of started sharing bass and guitar duties with Lucy, one of the two female singers. Yeah. And, and then kind of started making it a little bit more electric. When I first joined, there was, there was a... a a plethora of instruments being used and a lot of different styles. And we've kind of honed it down, had a name change to high shelf remedy. And, uh, uh, we, we released an album during lockdown, which we're all so proud of. It's a fantastic album. We managed to, we managed to do a, sh- uh, uh, an album launch for it, uh, during lockdown, oh, which was very, we had to, we had to do a matinee and an evening show. Uh, and literally, everybody who came was somebody who had been connected to the album. So we had Alex Schmetkoff who did the artwork. We had, um, all everybody had a connection to it, which, which was really kind of nice way of saying thank you to people. And it is, it's, it is a great album. I'm very, very proud. I'm got something. I'm, I mean, Lucy, um, Davis, who's, who's one of the girl singers with Lauren, um, recorded it all produced it all and everything uh we we got it we spent a lot of money on the mastering which is is the kind of thing that turns a uh, a local demo into a <laughs> a proper <Yeah>. album <laughs> yeah, yeah i mean you know uh, that's you could you can yeah, i mean we've we've all got equipment now in our houses which is is capable of producing you know radio quality music but what sets it all apart is the ability to mix it and you know to, to finish it in a way where and and to make an album sound like a complete thing i mean this is what's so beautiful about this album. we've been the, the, on the three occasions we've been able to go out and play the album we've just played it in its entirety so we play it in the order that it is on the actual That's album cool. thing which is it's good because we've spent a lot of time thinking what song would work well after what song and everything so it yeah. plays as a complete piece yeah so very pleased with that and then cool. um I'm 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 still play in a a 
oh, I don't know how you would describe it. It's a kind of like, you know, it's about, it's, there can be anything from nine to 12 of us and that's called Moonbeams. And that's with my good dear friend, Conrad Barr, who, who I think you'd be hard pushed to find someone in Bournemouth who wouldn't recognise that that guy's probably over the last 30 years been the most important figure. Oh, definitely. In, yeah. yeah. Conrad gave I, me, Mike gave me, gave me several of my first gigs and... You and everyone else. Yeah, and I, yeah, I'm one of pretty much every musician locally. He's one of the few be- people I think who does it for the right reasons anywhere. He believes in music. He believes in music, and he believes in music. And he believes in original music. I yeah. mean, the work we we did with with running grooves on the green as well to put on a festival in front of a thousand people and being able to s- put our foot feet down and say this has to be original bands yeah. this is a way of us saying thank you to the bands who turned up on a wet monday night and played to like 20 people in a room yeah. here in the opportunity definitely they on a big stage in the sunshine in front of thousands of people yeah which is i like- always felt that way when i played it as well it was felt like a big deal and i was always really happy that it was run by it was run by people who were doing it uh who were not making money all year round doing it for the yeah yeah, I, I mean, it, I, don't, yeah. I don't think it would come as a surprise, but I think both myself and Conrad lost a lot of money doing Solid Air. There were nights where we didn't, yeah. you know, didn't even cover the petrol for the gig sort of thing. But, you know, but there were other amazing nights. So, and that's great. So I play in Moonbeams with, 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 with Conrad. It's all his, his music. He writes beautiful songs. Uh, and we've got, we've got someone, we've got a Hammond player. We've got someone who plays the viola. We've got a, a harpist, a flute player, you know, it's, it's a real collective and it, it's great. You know, and it's, nice. but, and we hardly have a gig, which is, which is, which is nice. So every time we do it, it's fresh and it's yeah. fun. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. get that. I, well, I might have to wrap this up because it's about time for me to open the shop, but um, oh. thank you so much yeah, for you, coming on and doing this. You're the most talking person ever to, do this so oh <laughs> no it's great i mean i every single guest i've had i've wanted to carry on but i've been um limited by the amount of time i had i mean i was chatting once to um to kaimana souza from kanalea yeah. and we, we talk all the time so we had this really long conversation eventually the camera overheated and i had to stop the podcast oh. because the oh. camera wouldn't work and then film the ending about an hour later and call it back so it's all good well Thank you for coming on. I'm going to put some links for for the projects that you've you've mentioned because I I'd, I'd love people to discover your music. I've always really enjoyed listening to you, and I've learned so much from you over the years. Thank you, Alex. No, it's 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 my pleasure to talk to you, and uh, yeah, thank you very much, Paul Tucker. We'll uh, we'll see you again very soon. Thank you. Right.